before you break into the first team, if you're in the academy, you have to be a ball boy. So you're scattered around the pitch and you keep you keep an eye on Duffer, you learn from him. So you'd be sitting there and I would sit near the halfway line. So as you're going in, you'd get the whistle, go and get two guys' fags out of your suit. So you'd go and get them, meet him down the tunnel, he'd run into the disabled jacks, have a smoke, and Mark Hughes would be waiting, waiting for two guys to go back in and then he'd start his team talking and thinking. But he was unbelievable. He was just one of those guys that every now and then there's, a, there's an exception to the rule and two guys was, was an exception, yeah. yeah. You are listening to House of Football, brought to you by Sports Joe and William Hill. Hello, I'm Eric Lawler. Welcome to House of Football with Sports Joe and William Hill. This is episode 19 and I'm delighted to say I have two brand new guests in the studio today. Two men who played together for a short time in the League of Ireland with St. Pat's Athletic. To my left, we have the man who scored his 100th goal at Dalymount Park. Broke my heart as Pat's hammered bows 4-0 and he happened to score from 60 yards. Still, to this day, one of the best goals I've ever seen in the flesh, but I'll never admit that to him, although I've just done that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to my right, we have a former Premier League footballer, Irish international, and a man who played played in the League of Ireland as well, Keith Tracy. He's a, lads, you're very welcome to the podcast. Cheers, thanks for having us. And thanks okay. for coming along. Okay. Uh, what, we'll, what we'll talk about first is the whole big World Cup that's going on at the moment with the women. Um, the Irish campaign came to an end yesterday. Just wondering, have you been watching it all and have taken it all in, Conan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. well, specifically the the Irish games, Eric. You know, um, thought it's been a great campaign for the Irish first World Cup. Um, putting the group of death. Yeah, with, it was with Australia, the co-hosts playing in front of seventy five thousand people in their first game. Um, you're always going to be up against it. Obviously, the Olympic champions in Canada, and then Nigeria as well. They're ranked fortieth in the world, but well, probably the best team in Africa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? But they're they're, they're not forty no, the as, as we all know. They beat Australia three two. So to come away from from that with a point, the clean sheet in the last game against Nigeria yesterday was was great. Um, it's just a fallout that's disappointing because the front pages today of the paper should all be about the women's team and how great they did over in Australia and New Zealand. But unfortunately, it's yeah. it's the fallout from that. Keith, you've seen the Irish matches yourself? Yeah, I've watched all the Ireland games. I, I'd be fairly similar to what Conan thinks. I think, you know, we don't want to be condescending to the women's game, but this is their very first World Cup. Yeah. They're, they're only putting building blocks in. And I've heard a lot of people saying to me, you know, can we not take the handbrake off? Can we not play Katie a bit higher up? Can we not switch from the five at the back? And I'm thinking, the level of opposition we're up against, if you do that, you're leaving yourself really exposed at the back. So... Look, I think the way we did it was the right way to do it. I think there's ways as footballers you can stomach losing and we lost well. We we were competitive for large, large periods in all of the games. I know Nigeria people are saying could we not have really went for it there but we've got a first ever point after three games against very, very good opposition. So, yeah, look, I think it's good. I think we've put building blocks and I think for the women's game now there'll be a knock-on effect for young women watching this, young lads watching this and hopefully we'll reap the benefits a couple of years down the road. That's what I was going to say to there, Chris, uh, uh, Keith, was the, the fact that is this this the like uh, the Italian 90 moment for women's football in this country? Do you think it will spur many, many more girls to get out there and play football and get into that team? I think so, yeah. I definitely hope so. Look, I was born in 1988, so my memories of the Irish team, the Irish men's team playing in the 90s is what really inspired me to want to go and be a professional footballer. So I'm sure there's, there's young women, young men that are watching the girls in the World Cup now because... You know, it's probably going to be a long time before we see the men there. But the women have done us really, really proud. They competed very, very well against very, very good opposition. Let's be honest. And like Conan said, it probably has left a little bit of a sour taste in the mouth with the Katie McCabe and Vera Powell bit of falling out. But this is this is the big leagues now. You're going to get this at, yeah. this, at this level of football. So I, I think it's all something about nothing, to be honest with you. But this is what happens at top level football. Yeah, just on that, Conan, I suppose, as you alluded to, the, the, the pages are all about the little kind of Tiff, I suppose, between McCabe and Pow. Um, and you put out a tweet yourself uh, saying, um, Am I the only person who thinks that a player shouldn't be demanding substitutions or some words to that effect? I'm paraphrasing here, but um, uh, was, was Katie McCabe out of line, do you think? It's hard to say, it's hard to say because we're, we're not there. Yeah. Um, we can only judge by what we saw on TV. And it was, she was, she was, it looked as if she was looking for a substitution to be made and saying it in a, in a way where it looked demanding. Instead of just going, she, Vera Pell was over on her touchline for that second half. So there was a lot of throw-ins. He easily could have, could have went over to her and had a little word in her ear to say, look, I think we're getting a bit run down this side. Are you going to be making any changes soon? Or, or, or something to that effect. But when you're doing it in the way that she did, it shows a, a little bit of disrespect towards your manager. And in terms of after it, we know from experience that Vera Pell is very honest in her interviews. Mm, very direct. Absolutely. Yeah. And she was asked a question by a journalist 
and she gave the answer that she felt was appropriate for it. I don't think she was throwing Katie under the bus. No. It's just a case of just being an honest manager, which she has been, even through her um, exclusion of players that perhaps other other people might have thought should be in the World Cup squad, the likes of Jamie Finn or Leanne Kiernan, gave valid reasons why they weren't in the team or in the squad for the World Cup. So I, I just think, like he said, it's like something out of nothing in a way. Yeah. But the zip emoji after the game from Katie McCabe that was fuel to the fire a little bit. That added it? a bit of a bit more fuel to the fire. Um, I don't think a player should be demanding a, a substitution, a player to be substituted, especially a player that's playing in front of you. And the ironic thing about it is the fact that with about 10, 15 minutes to go, I thought Katie McCabe herself was very leggy yeah. and probably could have been taken off herself just because of the effort that she had put in over the previous 75, 80 minutes because she was out in the right wing position. She was in the 10 various times. Um, so she had put everything. Her, she put her heart and soul yeah. into it. And let's be honest, she, was a, she had a fantastic tournament. But... There's ways about doing things. And in the heat of the moment, I think she got that right, that decision yeah. wrong. Have you ever been in a position like that, uh, Keith, through your career, where you've seen a player demanding that the ref, the manager makes a substitution or gets too big for his boots or whatever? I have. You have? You I have? actually was on the receiving end of a check. Go on, Somebody Connor, demanded give us a, that you got taken off. <laughs> Go on, tell us that. <laughs> tell us. FEI Cup Final, 2009. Yeah, I was um, sporting finger, obviously, like Rovers. Yeah. Tallis Stadium. We were 1-0 down. Robert Bailey. I am a... Uh, I am standing between Robert Bailey and Liam Buckley, the manager. And he's like, he needs to be taken off. Like, you, and you could hear him? Oh, I can hear him right in front of my face. <laughs> but like, as Keith knows, I'm the most laid back player yeah. on the pitch and off the pitch. You could say anything to me. Yeah. And sometimes players use that in a way that like, they'll, they'll go mad and they'll drive, try and say anything to me to drive themselves on. Um, but yeah, I just led. Yeah, he's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> but did, Liam, did you get substituted? No, no. <laughs> you see, the thing, Liam never took me off because he always says that that I'd always there's always a goal. There's a goal, yeah. Well, we won the game two one, so it was a uh, good decision yeah. from him. Where is your man Bailey now these days? Well? <laughs> <laughs> but he's not doing podcasts. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Keith, um, I suppose uh, like. The, the, the Vera, we keep going back to it because let's be honest it's a big story of the Irish uh, adventure in Australia um, a lot of the players have been you know they've been asked do they want Vera to stay on and not one of them has committed and said yeah we'd love to see her stay on she wants to stay on she's ready to sign a new contract um, but it seems that, like there's a little bit of friction there between the management and the players um, like is this the end do you think of, of Powell's reign as, a, as the Irish manager? <coughs> Performance wise, Eric, it probably shouldn't be. I think she's she's Very warranted. True. She's warranted a new contract. Uh, she's done really well in the World Cup. I know we haven't won a game, but like we talk about building blocks for this World Cup, we got there. It is a big achievement to get there. The level of opposition we played against, but I have to be honest, I feel the writing is on the wall when managers start grinding against the the so called bigger players within the dressing room. Katie McCabe is obviously one of them. I think Denise O'Sullivan has had a little one or two yeah. little jabs here or there as well. So, look, I think the writing is on the wall for Vera Powell, but one thing Vera can do if she is to go away from this is walk away with her head held really, really high. And one thing people always say, I know footballers seem to be getting a little bit softer these days and Vera is not one of these managers who will soften her approach, but she's not going in there to be friends. You're not going no. in there to be the friends manager. You're being going in there to be the coach. And if that's if you have to tell some home truths or you have to motivate people in a certain way, like Conan has just said, then so be it. She's not going there to be a friend. And she got she's getting the best out of this Irish team. I know people are saying the way we play, this and that, can be a bit more effective. I don't think so. I don't think the, the grass is greener on the other side just yet. But look, if she is to walk away, whoever it is is inheriting a very, very good Irish team. I think it's the casual viewer as well, Eric, that mm. maybe they haven't been watching the, the Ireland women's games over the last number of years. This is the way Vera plays. She plays that low mm. block, the five at the back, the two sitting in midfield. That's the way she plays. Mm. She said that's the only way that Ireland can win games. Yeah, she said her defenders are too slow to play higher up the pitch. And which it's which which again is her, her directness her bluntness like yeah. she's colour as it is but that's it but like and uh, people saying that Katie McCabe, McCabe should be playing higher up the pitch well then who's going to play at left back we've we, we've seen players coming in the likes of Izzy Atkinson yeah. who's who's got, got brought in she came in for the Canada game but she was exposed to the back post twice in the second yeah, half against Canada so th there are reasons behind she's a very experienced manager we've got to remember this she's she's managed at the highest level mm -hmm. and with the way that she has set up her team she got us to a World Cup and performed very admirably there and I'll be disappointed if she goes Okay I, I, I see a little a similarity with the men and the women because obviously the women now have got to a World Cup and they're thinking can we do a bit more can we play a little bit more of this sexy football the men went down that road with Stephen Kenny and think can we play a little bit more sexy 
And to be fair, I think we've been banging our head on the wall the last two and a half years with Stephen Kenny because I don't think the players are there. I think if Vera Pau starts to open up and think we play this sexy, expansive football, we put Katie McCabe in midfield, how do you get the ball into midfield then? Because Katie is a big outlet for yeah. us from the back playing into midfield. So you're just the blanket's not big enough to cover everything either. You cover the head and the feet hang out, or you cover the feet and your head hangs out. It's one or the other. So I think Vera's got a spot on. And like I have to be honest, going into this World Cup, I was thinking don't get torn over 4 nil by Canada don't get torn over 4 nil by Australia stay in the game and we did that yeah, and like did. I say sometimes you can lose a game and not be okay with it but just be able to stomach it because we were in the game we competed for large periods and that's all you can hope for against these bigger nations I suppose it is uh, it's, it's kind of like a clash of two big personalities with Pau and McCabe like McCabe is one of the top players in the English Premier League like for Arsenal like player of the year mm. and you know, a, a vital part of that really strong Arsenal team. And Vera, as you say, she's this Dutch lady who is known for her bluntness. But Dutch, that's a Dutch characteristic. Mm. Dutch people are very direct and very blunt. And I suppose some players will 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 take the bluntness as as an attack on their on on, on their performance levels, on their abilities. Um, but then you would see. Uh, I saw. I was a was it Stephen Kelly was on a, was on RTE and he was saying. But you know, that's been immense football all mm. forever. Like, but I go back to that. This is big. This is. The big leagues now, you're going to get that sort yeah. of stuff. You're going to get criticism that you thought you didn't have. You draw it against Nigeria, thinking on the outside. That's a great result, but you're going to get criticism within this because of the level you're at now. So I think the, the girls are, it's it's opening up a whole new world to them. But look, they've taken to it like a duck to water so far. You see, when they sh- when they had sh- went on strike back in t- uh, t- 20, April 2016, since then they've been on the crest of a wave. Everybody has been following, following them. There's been no criticism whatsoever. And we've seen some of the cracks before the World Cup in that press conference where Katie McCabe got up and said what she had to say. She goes, well, thanks for wishing us well, the World Cup, to, to that regard. So you could see that the tension was there from Katie towards the journalists anyway about the impact that the World yeah. Cup is having. Now, it should have been all about Ireland getting to their first World Cup. And I've been saying it from the rafters that there hasn't been enough support from home in terms of bunting everywhere yeah. and that type of stuff. It's been very quiet. It's only happening really at the football clubs. Yeah. Um, and in fairness, the watch parties have been absolutely fantastic up and down the country. But I'd like to see more. I think if it would have been the men's game, it would have been we would have seen a lot more. Um, but I think just going back to that, then with it's the first time that we've had a bit of criticism to, aimed towards the Irish team, and they haven't handled that well. Right, because as you say, it's the first time they received, and they're like, "Well, they, 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 they perceive it as an attack yes. on them." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, that's where professionalism comes into it again, because this is everybody gets criticised when they play football. The one thing about football is. Everybody sitting in the pub, sitting in the house thinks, I could do that yeah. job. So you're going to get criticism from absolutely everybody. And it's just another stepping stone, another block for the women. But like I say, I'm sure they'll be fine with it. So how, uh, if, if, if we, how do we build going forward, lads, um, if Vera Pau still So just say, we give a scenario, Vera Pau moves on, we get a new manager in. Is it, is it much of the same? Are we looking at the blood new players? Or, or what way are we going to go, go forward and progress? We do have a... Fantastic young players. Like we have Jess Sue, we have Jesse Stapleton that's actually just moved to West Ham recently as well. We have the likes of Izzy Atkinson and Abby Larkin that have that have taken the, the World Cup by storm, specifically Abby. Um so there is players coming through that are that can compete and, and play at international level. The only problem is is that they probably can't they don't have the facilities in yeah. place here to be able to do that. So they have to move elsewhere to the WSL. And that's where Jesse Stapleton has moved. It was a disappointment maybe that she didn't get into the World Cup squad. Um, but now that she's in, in West Ham, I guarantee that she'll be in the, in the World Cup squad or the, the squad for the Aviva game against Northern Ireland. Yeah. And that's the most important thing, Eric, to get into the Euros in Switzerland in 2025. You've got three games now in the Nations League against uh, Northern Ireland, Albania and Hungary. Well, six games home and away. And then if we do well in that, we should, we should win the group. It puts us in a great opportunity then to progress to the quali- to the. Just, yeah, just like yeah. you just mentioned it there, Conan, the, the, like the next game is the Nations League qualifier against Northern Ireland and Cindy Aviva. Mm. And I think maybe the FEI were banking on mass hysteria about this World Cup. You now, it has been a lot of, well, in certain pockets of the country and counties, uh, certainly I was the only person in my road had bunting up. Um, but it's there since Patrick's Day. No, no, I put it up for the World <laughs> Cup. I put it up for the World Cup. Um, and I, what I did notice, though, was a couple of neighbours then, a couple of days later, started putting theirs up. So I said to Shran, I was delighted with myself. But there hasn't been, as you, as, as, as you said there, Keith, there hasn't been this big, massive hysteria around it like there would be for the Men's World Cup. But they're playing Northern Ireland in the Aviva. And I'm just hoping that to get a crowd of more than five, 6,000 at the Aviva. Do you know what I mean? Otherwise, it's going to look pretty... You know, aesthetically, it's going yeah. to look a bit shit, and you wonder why they've mm-hmm. taken them away from Tallis Stadium, where they've had full houses, atmospheres, electric, and the team. You know, they they, they feed off that. 
I can guarantee at least 15, 20,000 You reckon, people. yeah? I think so, yeah. I think just with the fact that they've been selling out Tala over the last number of uh, number of games, um, I was at an open training session before the World Cup and 1,500 people turned up at a training wow. session for them. So the hype surrounding the, the, the after effects of the World Cup, the girls that are, that are starting to play football again, what an opportunity to go and watch the women's team play uh, against Northern Ireland at the Aviva Stadium. The first time the girls have ever done that. Um, it's an historic moment. And even that alone... I think would draw a crowd. I've been a bit of a bandwagon, I'll be honest with you, jumping on the bandwagon, the Irish mm. women's bandwagon, but I've really gotten into it over the last few months, particularly since they qualified, I've really kind of looked at the team and looked at the players and uh, and gotten to know them and, and gotten to love them. I love Katie McCabe, I love Denise O'Sullivan, I love Megan Connolly, there's some superstars in that team um, and I feel like myself, I'll definitely be there at the Aviva, but I'm just hoping that you do, as you say, get 15,000, 20,000 into the Aviva. Otherwise, it's just going to look a little bit aesthetically poor on TV kind of thing, like, you know, and we but don't want a, that. That's at least, I, like, I'm expecting more. Yeah. But I'm, I'm saying that's that's the least amount that you'd expect, yeah. I think. Who sponsors the women's team? Oh, it's the guy, isn't it? Cool, Maybe yeah. if they give out free TV passes or something, the place will be packed. <laughs> 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 There's a little idea for you, Sky. Um, but anyway, listen, lads, we go back to uh, go back to our your, 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 your careers. Um, he's played together uh, at Pats. Was it for how long did you play together for at Pats? Just a season, wasn't it? Just a season. Just a season. Yeah. Year, maybe. Bit, maybe. Bit I think I was there for two years, but maybe only playing for about a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, can you talk to us uh, as well, Keith, about your, like you, you started with Belvedere, was it Belvedere yeah, was your yeah, schoolboy club? Uh, I was a Stella man, by the way. But anyway, Belvedere, uh, you, uh, you, 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 so what was it like when you moved from from Ireland as a youngster over to England, the challenges you faced? It was very difficult. Um, see, I, I, at 13, I, I was going to sign for Celtic because there's no YTS system. So at 14, I, I was in Parkhead about to sign the, the contract. Yeah, because there's no YTS, there's no, uh, there's no YTS system. So you turn professional straight away. They were going to move my mother and father over. They were going to give me three hundred pound a week. So for me to go back to uh, me told you in school and people telling me, Keith, you need to listen to the maths teacher. You need to." Listen. <laughs> I was yeah. absolutely away with the fairies. But when I when I eventually, as any young man will be, yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose, yeah. So when when I actually left and went to Blackburn, Blackburn for anybody who doesn't know the training ground, it's like Emmerdale Farm. And <laughs> the the words my mother used to me was you need to sign for Blackburn because you won't get in trouble here. Okay. And I, I ended up proving it wrong in the end. But <laughs> <laughs> it was That was basically, I loved it there. I signed there because Duffer was there. There was a couple of Irish in the reserves as well. And I just got a, a homely feel off the place. And they did. The, the secretaries looked after me when I bought me house. They came and put me curtains in my house. They made me bed no for me. They were only short of wiping my arse from <laughs> half the time, to be honest with you. But I, I developed very little social skills, but... Yeah, it was difficult. I, I cried myself to sleep for the first probably six months while I was over the there. Home sickness. So, yeah, yeah, like uh, yeah. we had communal toilets, so I'd get out of bed at midnight, just go and have a cry for a couple of hours, and then go back into bed. And people always said to me, "But well, how come you didn't come home?" Because like, I didn't want to come home. Right. I, I wanted to be a footballer. I was sad. I was missing home, but I was never going to leave. You know, yeah. it was one of them. I had that bit between my teeth, but. Yeah, difficult, very, very difficult time. So there, even back then, Keith, was there player welfare officers or anything like that at Blackburn? Does it, was there any managers or coaches that took you under their wing and said, look, we look after you, fatherly figures or anything like that? Uh, there was one or two coaches that tried at the time. Gary Bowyer was my uh, academy manager at the time. Um, Graeme Souness was the fourth team manager, but he he pretty much went to Newcastle about a month after okay. I had signed. Damien Duff went to Chelsea. So even the winger, the, we had a, like a, a coach who used to do... Uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one winger stuff. He left after about two weeks when I signed as well. So the R sort of fell out of the club, the reasons I signed. But all in all, it, it was really good experience. But like I said, difficult, really difficult yeah. at times. You wouldn't want to be paranoid, would you? Signing for a club and within three months <laughs> yeah, of signing, everyone's leaving. Yeah. <laughs> it was, was it a case in terms of the, like fear of failure even? Like when, or those six months of coming home or maybe there wasn't much stuff at home for you? Is that would that have been a yeah? Well, there was a little bit of a fear of failure, but in in terms of like the the father figure or, or somebody trying to help me, I think they generally look at your football and if your football's okay, they leave you alone. And although I was maybe depressed and got into this rut of you know crying and just burying me emotions and just getting on with things, I think people were thinking, oh well, keep training with the reserves or he's training with the force team, he's playing for Ireland, so we don't need to worry about him, yeah, he's okay type yeah, of thing. Yeah. So, although the, the footballer was going from strength to strength, the human being was being left behind, I was fairly depressed, struggling to sleep, but I'd torn up and my talent would mask an awful lot of the problems that I'd had the night before. So, yeah, maybe I, I wasn't strong enough to actually pull somebody and tell people how I was feeling, but again, at 15, 16, you feel like you're in competition with people, you don't want to be knocking on the manager's door and saying, gaffer, by the way, I'm a little bit weak mentally, right. you know, so you, you feel like you're in between a rock and a hard place and, I just got my head down and 
just ploughed on with it. Really. That's, that's incredible as well, Keith, because despite all of that, you, you, you broke into that first team squad. Mm. Like, and what, what was that like? What was that moment like? I was crazy. I remember uh, the forced away game. It was it, Paul Ince, my, my first Premier League game. Paul Ince was actually the manager, and we had signed Keith Andrews from, uh, I think it was MK Dons, Keith came from. And the two of us are sitting on the bench in Goodison Park, and we're losing one nil, seventy fifth minute. And Paul in stones around. He's like, "Keith, warm up, you're coming on." And the two are looking at each other. Oh, I just looked Paul in straight in the eye and thought, well, he's talking about Keith Andrews, like, and he went, "No, it, it's you." So I, I went and warmed up, and yeah, I, I tell I, us what's going through your head, Keith, as you're warming up at Goodison. Don't do anything wrong. Don't do anything <laughs> wrong. Don't like we were already losing. The gaffer was telling me, "Listen, just try and get us a goal. Try and change the game for me." But li- I was coming on thinking, just that, just. Be okay. Don't make any don't, mistakes. Don't make a show yourself. Yeah, don't yeah. give the ball away. And I remember the. I think it was Andre Uwe or the right back switched the ball, and I'm playing left wing, and Phil Neville comes and presses me, but I let the ball just travel to our left back. Our left back crosses, and we score a goal. It's one all, and they all run. Oh, Keith, brilliant! So I go, we just got smashed in the build up, but <laughs> it was just a little thing of thinking. Oh, right, maybe I'm okay yeah, here yeah, now. Yeah. You know, it's but yeah, uh, Goodison away, the crowd on top of you, losing one nil going on. It was deep water, but. You know, had it, had you been told a couple of days before, it, you get time for it to build in your head. But you know, two minutes you're coming on, so and get ready. Yeah. No time to it. think. I yeah. think it's better just been thrown in the deep end like that, and it's either sink or swim, isn't it? And was it Ince left shortly after that, or was it <laughs> Ince? Uh, we were sit- we, on that. We went to we went pre season in Austria, and every single night we'd, we'd have a flip chart at dinner, and it'd be like, "This is what we're doing tonight, lads," and we were out. We were there for two weeks. We were out nearly every single night. Somebody put on the flip chart, please can we stay in, Gaffer? <laughs> it was that, it was just a joke, like, but Paul Ince came in. He said, lads, I don't mind just having a drink of like a bit of wine because he, he played on the continent with Inter and that. So he was, you yeah. know, he liked his wine with dinner. But he just, uh, it just, he said, uh, by Christmas, we'll be peaking and that's when we'll get out of this relegation fight. So by Christmas, he lost his job, you know what I mean? Right, so right, right. he just didn't time it very well. We, we played Wigan. I remember we played Wigan away, got B5 3. And we're all sitting in the in the DW Stadium, hands on our heads, and we're thinking, we need to get to Manchester Airport, like the flight's in an hour. And Paul Ince is ranting and raving, giving out, and he's gone, I've ran yous, I've find yous, I've bollocked yous, I've done everything. Go and get pissed and see if that does anything for us. <laughs> and by the time we landed in Dublin, he'd be sacked. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Colin, you were the... You, you, I was, we were obviously doing... Um, Backup checks on you on both years. Backup checks, that sounds... You know, you're looking at your careers. <laughs> are they, got are they the okay hip? for the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Have they any crimes or misdemeanors? Uh, Conan, um, you um, you turned down uh, a trip to Zambia to go on Troy with Millwall, was it? Yeah. Geez, your yeah, <laughs> yeah, tell you. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so back in secondary school, I was... Um, Selected to go on a trip to Zambia. And sorry, your school bike club was a River Valley, was it? In Swords? It was Swords Rovers. Swords Rovers, yeah. okay, right. <laughs> Belvedere, Stella, Home Farm. <laughs> sorry, too. You must have really stood out. <laughs> Swords Rovers. <laughs> but uh, no, I was just in, in secondary school in Arts Gorish, and every couple of years they went to Zambia. And um, at that time, I was over and back in Toronto, Millwall. And that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a footballer, even though I played for Swords Rovers. But um, it was a case then where a decision had to be made. And um, I said, right, I'll, I'll, my dream is to be a footballer, so I'll go to trial in Millwall. But if the opportunity ever arose that it, to do to go to Zambia, I'd go. Yeah. So that was the decision I made with myself. So ultimately, it came out about five years later. I was uh, I went to the exact same place that my secondary school went to and um, struck up a great relationship with the Presentation Sisters over there. And like, how did the like? W- 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 how did your time at Millwall go? How did the trials go? How did how did it work out for you? Um, not bad, like, because the likes of Mark Quigley was over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he was on the first He's team. Player, he was. was class. Yeah. Um, so good. But, yeah, I did okay. Like, I remember going to the Tottenham training ground and scoring in a 1-0 win. I mean, first, first, uh, first game, like? first game, yeah. It was, like, it was only a, uh, it wasn't a, a competitive game. It was friendly. Doesn't matter. But even scoring against Spurs. Yeah. And, as I said, I never played the likes of Belvedere or Home Farm or Stella. So, my first experience of this type of football was playing Spurs. Wow. Uh, scoring, <laughs> win, uh, scoring the winner. Um, and then, as I said, over and back, played a couple of games then against Norwich and um, you know, I can't remember now, Preston maybe. Um, and that, that they were great experiences. I was asked to, to sign a contract in the end of fifth year. It was a one-year YTS and two-year professional. Um, but I knew myself I wasn't good enough to go without an education, without okay. me even cert. Um, right. And that's, people might say, oh, like, that sounds a bit strange. Why, why would you think that? But... It's a very mature th- way yeah, to, to look at things. Awareness there, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I would have been um, growing up. I never had. I never, as I said, I always, even 
playing League of Ireland, I always felt as if I had to compete against everybody because of where I came from, right. in the sense of the club I played for, because I never played <coughs> for those bigger clubs, never got international recognition. So I always felt as if I had to punch above my weight to to do well. Was that at the start of your <coughs> League of Ireland career? Oh, right, yeah, right, 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 right through, yeah. Right through, but like you're a man who's like, has a goal record of like one every two games or something like that. Yeah, Ridiculous but record. I, I just felt I always had to prove myself to others. And maybe it was good to I needed to myself, yeah, 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 because it pushed me on. Yeah. Push me on definitely, but like I said, no. I said, I said to them, look, if you wait till my leaving cert finishes, and they said no, and I said, okay, well then, I'm, wow, I'm it's that, that takes balls, well, yeah. <laughs> well done. But then I gave it up. I gave football up for a year. Just didn't fancy it at all. And then, um, oh, was it, was it, were you disappointed by that reaction no, from Millwall? No, 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 it was just a case of kind of the love went okay, for it. Like right. The dream was over, maybe. Yeah. Um, went to went to UCD and I was eating me dinner one night, and my dad, my father, put just dropped it, dropped the scholarship form for UCD over my head and said, just. You're in UCD. Why don't you go for the scholarship and, and, and go for it? I wasn't even thinking of League of Ireland football. Yeah, I was yeah, just thinking yeah. of the scholarship. Yeah. Um, and six months later, I was playing the League Cup final. So, <laughs> mad. Like, madness. How, well, that escalated how, very quickly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, it mad, it's mad how it works. You said you fell out of love of football there, um, uh, Conan. Does, did that ever happen to you at all, Keith? Did you ever fall out of love with the game? Yeah, it was difficult. I, I fell out of love a couple of times. I remember being being here with my wife and collecting the kids from creche and I rang Sean Dyche and said, that's it, I'm done. And, his, I thought he'd maybe, you know, my, my ego, I thought he'd beg for me to come back or, you know, he basically just said, son, if that's what you need, that's what you need, no problem. Okay. And he, he said, listen, if you want to come back, the door's open, but you come back once, you don't come back twice and three times. So he basically said, if that's what you need, then no problem on the human side, but we'd love to have you and didn't basically pressure me into anything. So yeah. he made me want to do Make it the rather decision than yourself him telling well. me I'm, right. you're doing it. Right. So just little man management, things like that. But yeah, it happens, you know, Probably once a month. Again, me. looking back at your career, Keith, and various news articles and all that, and I read somewhere where you had a you, you, you mentioned Deutsch and and, and you, you have a hell of a lot of respect for the man. Yeah. Um. Can you tell us a bit, like, like you just explained one thing he did there, which is a really noble thing for him to do. But what was he like day to day, and when you were suffering, and and how did he motivate you? How did he put the arm around you? And with Deutsch, the the first time, his first day. He, uh, I was after being out the night before because he got he got he got the job of the drop of a hat basically Wednesday night I was playing for the reserves because Eddie Howe put me into the reserves. Dice gets the job Wednesday. We're training on Thursday. I get a phone call. You're training Thursday morning with the force team. You're back in the force team. So I'm in Blackpool when I get this phone call. So I, I continue my night as as any good professional would. <laughs> and I train the next day and he puts his arm around me and he basically said, "Listen, son, I can smell the drink off you." And I started to pull excuses out of yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And he said, no, nah, listen, it's no problem. This is your one and only chance. There's a six-week fine waiting you as well. Because I went to my uncle's wedding under Eddie Howe and came back and I failed the breathalyzer. So he tried to do me six weeks wages. Sean Dye squashed that. He put his arm around me, brought me on a jog that day and said, listen, son, if you're fit, you're one of the first names on my team sheet. Wow. So you need to get fit. And most managers then had said had said something similar to me like that. So they'd say, go and tr- play for the reserves tonight and when you're fit, you'll be back into my team. But he did it with me. He put in the hard yards with me. And even when we're running around Burnley City Centre, just cars beeping at him, taking the mick out of him. And we're just chatting. He's like, how's your dad getting on? Because my dad had prostate cancer Sorry, at the time. So when you're saying you're running around Burnley uh, City Centre, you're running with Sean Dyche? Yeah, yeah. Like we, on a jog? Yeah, we would leave the training ground and we'd say, come on, we just run around Burnley. And people would be beeping at us, roaring at us. And no It way. was like a father and a son just running through Burnley and he'd be asking about my family, how I feel. And it was so far removed from football, it was unbelievable. And it was just somebody who tried to scratch the surface and think, how's Keith? How's Keith getting on? And I remember him saying to me, Keith, I don't care if you play for Burnley. I don't care how many appearances you make. I care about you as a human being. Wow. And for a manager to say that in the height of like we, we were going for promotion that year and the pressure he was under the as pressure well, he yeah. was under what the board must have been saying to him because I had come from Preston to Burnley I, I, I was heavy they wanted their return they paid a million pounds for me but for him to just take that away and say I just want you as a person to be right it's just obviously if the person's right the footballer will come but yeah. everybody's more worried about the, foot, uh, the footballer the footballer so for him to take a different angle on it and try and get me fit and speak to me about things and he would he very rarely played me. I think in the the season we got promoted, I played thirty eight games, but I, I started about fifteen. Right, and th- like notoriously, it was like QPR at home, the big teams at home. And I was thinking, he really trusted me in a, in a defensive manner, which nobody else really did. And he's just the sort of bloke you run through brick walls for. When he kept everything up, the first thing I did was text him and say congratulations, because he's the like footballers at that level are ships in the night. Does not like I had a 13, 13 year career over there in England and I keep in touch with only Sean Dyche 
that's wow. it. And it, that's just no friends. Like. And you, 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 you see Sean Deutsch and you see him as this kind of, you know, for want of a better an alpha male, yeah. mm. you know, tough as you know, tough as tough as old boots, and a man's man. Uh, maybe um, obviously after what you've just said there, Keith, uh, we I and I'm sure lots of other people have got him completely wrong. Um, so when he took over as the manager of Everton, did you immediately go, if anyone can save Everton, it's Sean Dyche? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, a lot, a lot of Everton fans came to me and said, oh, Keith, like, what do you think? Is he going to take us down? If he takes us down, he's the right man to bring us back up. And I said, hundred percent, he won't go down. Wow, he will not go down with him. And even now, people are saying to me, what's Deli Ali going to be like? Because we all, all the stuff has come out about yeah. him. There's no better guy than Sean Dyche to try and sort him out. And I, when the Deli Ali interview came out, I text Dyche and I said, listen, maybe there's one or two similarities there between me and Deli. If you want to pass on my number, we can have a chat. And his text back was that Delhi's in a really good place at the minute and long may it continue. Really? And just little things like that. It's like very rarely do me and Sean actually talk about football now. So it's just family stuff and like the Delhi thing was probably, uh, you know, quite close to football, but it was on a, on a human level that I wanted to make contact. So look, there's no better guy than Sean Dyche. And I remember Dyche at the end of last season, Delhi Ali had a, like a small injury and somebody said, oh, will he be available for next week? He said, He's injured at the minute, but this is going to take, this is a long road back for Delhi. Right. And I think Dyche knew, he, he obviously relayed to him what has happened, but yeah, no better guy than Sean Dyche. And he, he is an alpha male, he is all them yeah. things, but he has a soft touch, he has kids as well, he's, yeah. a, he's a father, he knows how, he has that light touch, but he has that fear factor as well that you didn't want to didn't want to let him down or disappoint him. You mentioned Eddie Howe there as well, he was a coach. Um, are you surprised, uh, or did you see... Something with Eddie Howe and go, this fella's going to be a top manager one of these days. I'd be, I'd be lying if I said I did, Eric, yeah, to be okay. honest with you, just because at Bournley, he, he had done really well at Bournemouth, then he got the Bournley job. And I think Eddie Howe was probably about, he was early 30s, maybe yeah. 32, Very young, 33. Wasn't he, yeah. And there was all the players in the squad than him, like the likes of Dean Marnie, Michael Duff. And it, this sounds like nothing, but in the world of footballers, footballers live in a completely different world. He was coming in, he's saying, Dino, son, I need you to pass this Duffer, son. And they're looking going, I'm older I'm than older you. Than you. Yeah. And, you know, he, he just he was just a little bit young. There were some egos in the dressing room that he couldn't quite get a hold of. And, look, I, I was a bit of a nightmare to try and manage as well. I, I, I give him that one. But, yeah, there was just, you know, playing out from the back at Turf Moor. I know Vince and company's done it really, really well now. But at the time, I mean, we're drawing a nil out the oval and they're screaming at me, get the ball forward. Not quite as nice as that, but something along yeah. those lines. And it, it, just, it just didn't link up quite well. But... You could tell he was a forward-thinking manager. He wanted to play out from the back. He would pl- demand that you play under pressure, but did I think he'd go and do as well as he did at Newcastle? Probably not, but he, you could tell he had it in the locker, but he didn't think it would go this well. Conan, in your uh, uh, vast League of Ireland career, was there any managers who stood out for you as being, who's the best manager you, you worked with? And, and I won't ask you who's the worst one either. <laughs> we'll just go with who's the best. Um, I suppose the, play, the manager that I won everything under um, would be Lane Buckley. Um Played me every week, kept me on for the ninety <laughs> minutes, unlike what other players wanted. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it would have to be Liam, and like that, it was everyone says it's a, like a father son relationship that I had with him, um, and it was similar to to Sean Deutsch in the sense that it was he always asked about how how my family was. He was brilliant around the time my partner was sick as well when he was uh, when he was manager. Brilliant around the time when I wanted to go into uh, education um, and go, go down the primary school teaching route. Um, so always supportive of stuff away from football. Right. And because of that, then you'd nearly give an extra 10%. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'd have to say Liam. Like I said, he signed me at Sporting Fingal, then he signed me at Pats. So I think I had nine or 10 years with him as manager. I loved the fact that uh, when you signed for Sporting Fingal, you're also signed as their marketing manager as well. That's a funny like one, a yeah. player marketing manager. I've heard it for player coach, player manager, but a player marketing manager. Is that, that true, yeah? Yeah, and he only he only went to sign me as a player. So we were at the um it was the Great Southern Hotel at the airport at the time and we were in there and he was just chatting to me about signing. I was leaving U C D and my scholarship had finished. So I was signing. I was dropping down two divisions to the A championship at the time, but because Kilkenny City's demise, oh, we yeah. actually went back up into the first division. And he was signing a good good group of players. Um, and he was just telling me his, his plans and, and aspirations for the club. There was a project um, project plan, development plan in, in the Fingal area about setting up a community, um, a training centre and a stadium. So I was like, this, this is great in my own backyard. So we're walking back out to the, to the car park and he's like, what did you do in college, by the way? And I was like, oh, sports management. And he's like, what, what does that entail? And I was like, I oh, just kind of the business side of sport, like sort of sport marketing and all this. And he goes, 
I'm going to take you back inside for a couple of minutes. <laughs> we have a vacancy. <laughs> yeah. Brought me back inside, showed me a, a, an opportunity within the club as sports uh, marketing manager of the of the club. So, yeah, I did that for one year and then we went full-time football. Right. So I took over the community. I was community development manager then. So after training, I was responsible for bringing players with me to schools and clubs and try to... And you would have been very young support. at that stage as well. Colin. Yeah, very young. Yeah. You know what I mean? like, yeah. that's, that's a, so I built up a lot of experience. A very big undertaking. Yeah, but I absolutely loved it. Did you it. love it? Yeah. Loved it. And the thing is, that's probably why with, with Fingal, when I went when I went under, I lost two jobs. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, uh, Can you yeah. get double dull for that? No, you can't. No, no. <laughs> don't think so. I didn't get it either. <laughs> um, Keith, we were looking at... Um, the players you've played with, the players you've played against, and you've played against some unbelievable talents. Can you tell us who's the best player you've ever come up against in the flesh? Uh, well, the obvious one would be Ronaldo. Like, uh, I remember coming on uh, for Blackburn and uh, Ronaldo was playing for United, but they had Rooney and Berbatov. They threats all over the park. But I, I, the one thing I always tell the little kids when they're asking me questions as well, like. I remember him standing me up, he's on the halfway line and I'm on the right wing, he's playing on the left wing and I was quite quick as a, as a young lad, yeah. a bit of an ego about me so I, I sort of showed him the line I said, come on then, we'll have I'll a race. <laughs> my God, like, he hit it and I put my hand out to stop him and it was just like putting my hand up against Granite and he just kept running and running and left me, within two seconds he was about five yards away from me. Wow, and I was just quick acceleration. And and I, I just pushed him, I, I fouled him anyway but then Alex Ferguson jumped up and started effing and jeffing you little lord of this and you little lord of that <laughs> but then about six months later I signed for his son I signed for Darren Ferguson at Preston but just like I remember skulls I, I remember uh, Old Trafford I got the ball on my feet and hit a diag with, a right, with my right foot and skulls has come in a couple of seconds late and milked me over but he picks me up he's like oh great ball son slap me on the arse and you think this is unbelievable like, Paul Scholes tell me I hit a great pass and, uh, some of the players are unbelievable Di Maria when he played for Argentina obviously Messi was there as well and, Everybody always oh, you played against Messi. Messi was coming off as right. he was coming on. Okay, so it was a that was of, the game with Diviva, wasn't Diviva, it? Diviva, yeah. yeah, a bit of a heartbreaker. But yeah, it's like some great players. Xavi Alonso played with Liverpool. Gerard Torres when he was in his prime. There's one interesting one uh, player that was that you were with at Blackburn, um, Benny McCarthy, right? Who's now like the striker coach at Man United. Yeah. And what struck me about um, his role there at Manchester United is that. Looking at him, uh, they, they, they had a video on the Man United account of the players coming back from pre-season and Benny arrives in and every single player went over and hugged him. Like, th th like there was a real love for the man. Yeah. Um, what, what, what was your memories of, of Benny? Uh, ben, yeah, Benny was a legend. Me and Benny got uh, got quite close because I was on the fringe of the force team so I would train with the force team, be on the bench for the force team, drop into the reserves, then train with the force team again. So I was sort of in limbo. Benny, When Benny force came to Blackburn, he had a deal in place that he would play a year for Blackburn and then go to Chelsea with Mourinho. Oh, right. So he played really well the four season for Blackburn. The Chelsea offer came in. Blackburn said, no, we think you're worth more than that. Right. So Benny said, right, I'm throwing in the towel then. I'm, I'm not doing it. So Benny started putting on a bit of weight, started taking the mick and train and didn't train properly. And that was when me and Benny became really close. <laughs> enough. So yeah, me, me and Benny... A fellow was, tortured soul. Let's go, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> and Benny was an absolute legend. Like some of the, the stuff he did for Porto back in the day in the Champions League, the oh, stuff he did for South incredible. Africa. Unbelievable player. Had a bit of a belly on him when he was playing at Blackburn, but... Yeah, you could see the talent, the way he controlled the ball, his force touch, the way he thinks, the way he taught. And me as a young lad coming into the force team, he was excellent with me. He he didn't have any airs or graces about him. He was a legend. I remember I went to a Pussycat Dolls concert with him and, and he paid the bill. So that, that's There's a cut down, lads. <laughs> Key Tracy went to a Pussycat Dolls concert well, with Benny Neo, Neo was warming up. That was the real reason I went. Neo was warming up, but the Pussycat Dolls was the main event. Yeah. Amazing. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry. Another uh, the, the one player we wanted to ask about as well at your time at Blackburn, uh, who uh, Killian, the producer, and myself, been used to love as a footballer was Two Guy. Mm. Um, your impressions of him and working with him, what he was like behind the scenes, training with him, and what a baller he was. Ah, uh, Two Guy, probably probably the best footballer I've ever played with. He, wow, that's why he plays because you played with a lot of good ones. <laughs> yeah, well, it's especially centre midfielders. Like, Two Guy was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. The way he, like the, his technique from them corners to the edge of the box his goal against uh, Spurs he used to cheat and bleep test like we'd be doing because he was I think he was about 45 when I got into the first <laughs> game but we used to do a bleep test and he would just set off doing his own just doing doggies he wouldn't do it to the BP he'd just do his own thing okay. and then he'd walk in have a fag he would he would get Coca-Cola delivered to the canteen, the canteen so we'd all be sitting there drinking water he'd have a bottle of Coke and a fag and you're just thinking how wow. is he getting away with it but then the talent of the man 
like nobody Mark Hughes couldn't say anything to him because he was just an absolute genius <coughs> so Mark Hughes said he can do what he wants as long as he's putting in performance well, he put like up that. a bit of a fight but two guy was sort of two guy was two guy he just did his own thing you know and he was I remember when when I actually signed for Preston I, I had failed the medical and I had to go to Manchester to do a for, uh, an MRI scan but they put me in the in the car with the physio to go to Manchester and we're booting down the motorway to go to this MRI scan and this Range Rover comes up alongside us on the motorway and it, I look it's two guy so I, I roll down the window and he's roaring at me Keith, Keith I, I hadn't been in training for two weeks at this point because Sam Allardyce had tried to sack me but I'm on the way to sign for Preston and he's shouting hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing my medical at Preston alright Preston they're shite, don't sign for them. <laughs> and then boots off like a hundred mile an hour and I roll up the window and I'm sitting next to a physio who I've never met before in my life after that little grenade has been thrown in. Don't sign for them, they're shite. <laughs> Another hour with this fella in Carlish. But I, yeah, I know two guys was a legend, an absolute yeah. legend. I remember the, it was starting to kill him beforehand and, and he brought me memory back to a game um, where Galatasaray were playing Man United and he was mm. the main man and he absolutely Boss the match, yeah. like absolutely like, against goals and all that. Like he was the main man, and you know, it just you know, it just couldn't contain him. And uh, yeah, he was just one of them superstar players. I just wanted that. It was great that we found somebody who's actually played with two guys <laughs> and can verify the fact that. And now he's an even more of a legend, drinking coke and smoking. Kids don't do that, by the way. But what I'm saying is, what a player! What that, a player! That, I was delegate. That was my half time job. So before you break into the force team, if you're in the academy, you have to be a ball boy. So you're scattered around the pitch, and you keep you keep an eye on Duffer. You learn from him. So you'd be sitting there and. I would sit near the halfway line so as you're going in you'd get the whistle go and get two guys fags out of your so you'd go and get them meet them down the tunnel he'd run into the disabled jacks have a smoke and Mark Hughes would be waiting waiting for two guys to go back in and then he'd start his team talking and thinking but he was unbelievable he was just one of those guys that every now and then there's, a, there's an exception to the rule and two he guys was, was an exception yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you just mentioned something there in, in, in your, when we were talking about two guys there uh, Sam Allardyce was looking to get rid of you yeah. Well, so so you did, yourself, yourself and Sam never saw each other? No, it, it's really weird because on a personal level, me and Sam actually got on. We okay. could sit in a room and have a, have a chat with each other, bounce off each other, have a, have a really good laugh. But on a professional level, it, it, you know what he's like. It's all percentage football. I remember cutting inside one day and trying to play the ball into, I think it was probably Benny's feet, and he stopped training. No, 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 I don't want none of that. Play the ball into the grass behind because the percentages are this and that. And we'll win a throw in. We'll put the throw in into the box. And you're just thinking... This isn't football. Where's my talent coming yeah, into all yeah. this? You know, you could get anybody to come and do this. But look, at Allardyce, what, Allardyce came into Blackburn to keep us up, and he did that. That's why he's just percentage football. But again, I, I go back to what I, I was drinking really, really heavily. I crashed my car on, I think it was Boxing Day. We were training in Ewood Park because the, the training ground had froze over, so we got to all train in Ewood Park. I was driving my car that I didn't have a licence for, crashed my car on the way to training, and that was it. He, I eventually got to Ewood Park to do the training a little bit late and as I was putting on my gear the doctor came in and said listen Allardyce the, the police have rang we know you've crashed you don't have a licence Allardyce has said he, he doesn't want to see you anymore wow. you're, you're done so quickly off to the airport and back to Dublin Conan um, the, the League of Ireland at the moment right uh, it's, 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 it's you know it's great it's very competitive at the moment because yeah. maybe Rovers aren't as strong as they have been in the last few seasons and yet they're still four points clear um, but I suppose it's the um, and the league has grown at an exponential growth over the last few years it's amazing to see particularly if you're a League of Ireland fans as we all are but um, I suppose for the for the, for the the armchair support out there the, the, the Premier League fan who maybe looks down at the League of Ireland um, wonder what all the fuss is about when our teams this year in Europe have comparatively struggled against teams from Luxembourg Iceland Faroe Islands or wherever they're from wherever they've been from um, is, it, is it a fair thing to say that the league hasn't progressed maybe as much as we thought it has due to the failures in Europe this season so far? I wouldn't put it down to that, um, Eric. Last year, Shamrock Rovers got to the group stages of the Europa Conference League. This year, they came up against a great team in Breda Blick, um, who dominated them from, from the Icelandic League, doing really, really well in that, that league. And we've got to remember that when Iceland qualified for the World Cup um, 2014, maybe 2010, I can't remember which one it was, they put all their money back into the domestic football. That didn't happen for us. Yeah, that so fame, the, but they also had that famous result against England, didn't it? Yeah, the England. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Steve McLaren in the in yeah. Sky Sports studio. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What um, a moment! Yeah, but no, I think it, it, the investment is needed, mm. and I think that's the main thing that we need in League of Ireland football is investment, and that's for boys and uh, for men and women, and at grassroots level as well, and international because there's a 47, 49 million going into Abbottstown as well with the with under the FAI strategic plan. Um, 
because they're not fit for pur- purpose at international level, the standard facilities there. So I think that's that's number one point, is that we need to improve facilities and across the country in order for us to develop our players and, and have them playing at, at a good level. In terms of European th- football this season, w- yes, Shamrock Rovers are probably, everybody looking at Shamrock Rovers and seeing the defeat that they had in the Champions League. They obviously got Ferenc Varas then of Hungary in the Conference League and they were defeated 4-0 away there last week in, in Budapest. Not ideal. They're going to be knocked out um, of the competition. Like Ferenc Varas have this historical name in European football. They're a, they're, they're a big team from Hungary, but they were beaten 3-0 at home by a Faroe Islands team in the yeah. previous round. And that's, that's the other point. I think that for all the progress that we have made as a nation, there are other nations that are making similar progress too. Mm-hmm. And it's not all about Ireland and, yeah, we're going to improve, but everybody else is going to improve as well. And, yeah. and we've seen that. Um, like... There's a Kazakhstan team that are beating um, Basel from Switzerland. And the winners of that actually played the Derry City Coupes game. So it could be a situation that if Derry beat Coupes from Finland, who are top of the Finnish league, Derry go into, the, into, a, into a game where they can have realistic chances of beating this Kazakhstan team um, if, they, if they beat Basel in, yeah. in the second leg. So I, I think, as I said, we always focus on the Champions League team. We always focus on our champion, Shamrock Rovers. But the other sides in, in Europe aren't, aren't doing too particularly bad. Derry City have progressed through a tie. Dundalk have progressed through a tie. Dundalk are 3-1 down against KA going into the second leg. I, 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 I do think that they'll get a result there, whether or not it'll, it'll be enough to go through, but I think they'll win. Yeah. Um, and obviously St. Pat's were very disappointing against Dudelange uh, from Luxembourg. Um, yeah, beating Dudelange in Europe isn't for everyone. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's that's my Bose fan. Head Absolutely. Out there. <laughs> so I think, we ha- I, I, I think we always have to look at it as a whole, yeah. rather than not just focus on Shamrock Rovers. They were beaten by a better team in Breedablick and they're beaten by a better team in, by, by, in Ferenc Varas and it just wasn't to be this year. Yeah. Um, you're right, they've brought their form and domestically haven't been good. They've brought that into Europe. Hasn't been ideal. The recruitment hasn't been great. Liam Burt was signed from Bohemians. He, he hasn't really done, hasn't um, done great. But what we're missing in League of Ireland football in, in, is, a, is an out-and-out centre-forward that can score goals. Obviously, Owen Doyle is now retired. There's another one that's, that, that's gone. But with Pat Hoobin um, and Rory Gaffney, they're they're just two players at the end of their careers. At the end of their careers, we've no number nine that is coming through. We've no players playing in League of Ireland. They're playing international football um, regularly. Um, so these are all things that facilities investment um, should improve. And the young players that are coming through, we have to make sure that they stay here and not and not leave. Keith, have you seen have you seen a noticeable difference in um, say the the professionalism in, in in the League of Ireland and the facilities, the standards, the coaching since you arrived and to where it is now? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely moving along. It's getting an awful lot better, even from the the time when I was in the league in around two thousand and fifteen to now. It's it's an awful lot better. Everybody's an athlete. Everybody can run all day long. Um, not so much when I was playing, but you see now where everybody can run, everybody's comfortable on the ball, everybody's trying to play the right way. You know, even now I go and watch Pats against UCD. UCD are trying to play out in the back, yeah. they're trying to play through the towards and you're thinking everybody's playing the same way. And when we go when the likes of Shamrock Rovers go to these so called bigger teams in Europe, not everybody has to play the same way. You know, you don't go toe to toe against these people. Well, like when you're playing when you're up against a boxer who's technically very good you don't go there and stand toe to toe with them you try and box and wave but I just think we need to go a little bit more back to front I mean the first game Sean Hart the centre half of Rovers is going and pressing in the midfield you're thinking why are you doing that because yeah. they want you to do that they yeah. want you to do that so they can pick in the spaces behind you if you stay flat I know it's a little bit standoffish but you're not giving them any space and you're, they're getting them to play in front of you so I know why Stephen Bradley is going full car press that's the way Rovers play that's what they do that's okay in this league. You won't right. get punished in this league. You go into Europe, you're going to get punished by better teams. And that's what's happened. And I think all across the board, uh, St. Pat's, not an awful lot in it against them and Dude Lounge, but Dude Lounge just come out the right side. Rovers got battered, but they made some silly mistakes. Alan Manis made a, a, a bad mistake for the first goal. Then it's a really big uphill battle all of a sudden. So I think Rovers probably a little bit outclassed. The other three, there's not a lot in it. Yeah. Really, really not a lot in it. It's probably a toss of a coin between the three and Pat's were very close, but out. I think Derry will go through. Dundalk, uphill battle like Conan. I expect them to win the game, whether or not they'll go through on the toy. Yeah, I suppose they get an early goal sure. Oriel, it's, it's yeah. game on, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Especially that pitch, on that pitch. That pitch yeah, yeah. 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 Makes that's a great level of that pitch, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. We always just have to look at the coefficient, Derek. I think that's really important. And when we look at the coefficient, we want all our teams doing well. Like a standalone team doing well in Europe won't really affect their yeah, coefficient. Pulls them away from the rest much. of us. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we want our, we want our coefficient to, 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 to do well. There's a great quote from you, Keith, um, where you said... Uh, 
when he came back to the League of Ireland, I'm poorer, but I'm happier. Mm. Is that is that a lesson maybe for any young footballers out there thinking of going to England or thinking maybe looking down the nose a little bit at the League of Ireland? Uh, p- possibly, but again, this this is all sort of changing now. People do view the League of Ireland as a stepping stone to maybe going into Europe or, or anything like that. But yeah, look what. There is a there was a bit of a stigma when I when I came back from England and I started playing in Ireland. I thought people just viewed me as a failure because I was in the Irish right. League, and maybe on a personal level, maybe that is right because of the the amount of talent I had. Maybe I should have been playing in England. I should have played for longer. But the League of Ireland is a very very good league. You look at our our starting eleven for Ireland. Most of them have yeah. uh, blooded their teeth in, yeah. in the League Fair of Ireland point. at some point. So the league is getting stronger. It's technically getting better. There's more fans coming to watch it. It is getting better, but. I just think everybody's a bit samey in the way they play. Everybody's a bit samey. You know, sometimes I, I, on YouTube there the other day, I was listening to Jack Charlton and he was saying in the, back in the 1990s, everybody's, we don't have to play the same way. And he was saying this in the 90s about a sweeper and uh, they'll only start attacking when their centre midfielder has good possession of the ball, then the wingers will come on. I was thinking, you could fast forward this to now. Yeah, this is true. all now. Everybody's trying to play the Manchester City way of football, but yeah. not everybody has the talent to do that. So people want to say I'm a dinosaur and go from A to B, but... I think there's ways that we can win games of football in Europe. It's might not be crosses, pretty. as you say. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah I don't yeah. think you can just throw a blanket and say we're going to play football and hope for the best. I think if, if football's not working, go from A to B, put the defenders under pressure and see what you get. Uh, you mentioned UCD there. I was at the Bowes UCD game on Friday in Daily Mount and as you said, yeah, UCD were trying to play up from mm. the back and they, they really put it to Bowes but I was under fierce pressure at that match because I, I was asked to do a gig for the Bowes squad on Saturday night, the night after it. They were having a get-together and I, here I am in the 74th minute going, oh my God, it's nil all. Yeah. And I'm going, if, if we don't get a goal here, this gig tomorrow night's going to be a bleeding nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know? And thankfully, Afalabi stepped up and we got two but... Uh, Colin, when 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 Keith when I remember when Keith um, came back into the league as you know and he was signing for Pats and you know he's, this player's coming from the Premier League he's he's, a, he's had a decent career in England and we all know how talented he was Irish international were, were, were you as, as players and squad really excited to hear that Keith was coming in to join the join the squad absolutely yeah and a, a couple of years previously Keith Fahey came back in as well at Pats he, he's he's another fellow scorer screaming at Daily Mount as well remember that yeah exactly yeah <laughs> but when Keith came in and we were kind of mentioned at the start is is one of his first games was the European game over in, in Minsk and as we all know Keith is a, is an out and out winger um, but Liam saw a position for him in the in the holding midfield role where we were struggling with injuries just carried a bit too much baggage wasn't he to play I was trying league. to be nice Keith yeah. I was just, just trying <laughs> to be nice yeah. Here, yeah. Yeah. Call call a spade fair enough <laughs> so uh, yeah so he had two runners around him and Keith was just happy enough just to sit in the six but uh, it's one of the best performances I've seen in, from somebody in a Pats jersey in that game we went over to uh, Dynamo Minsk we drew one all um, Christy Fagan scored but just for somebody, and that's when you knew how special that he was as a footballer. And I could only imagine what he would have been like if he had been fully fit and fully yeah. sound. Um, because in that game, he just dictated every time he had the ball. He just didn't give it away. He played everything, I wouldn't say simple, but he just, when he played forward, when he had to, kept the ball when he needed to, just the football made it look easy. Made it look easy. Football yeah. intelligence that he had was absolutely phenomenal. Um Stuff of dreams, I suppose, like yeah, when you're yeah. putting your heart and soul into it. And this fella turns up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like two guys with a yeah, I was just about to say, yeah, yeah two guys with a fagness mouth, yeah. But um, no, a very special player, yeah, definitely. And uh, Colin just mentioned it, Keith, you, you were played played in the, uh, in the in the 10 role. Is that, is that, have you ever played in that role before, Hand? I played in there once for Preston, yeah, and it was a relegation battle against maybe Scunthorpe or something like that. But yeah, I remember playing in the 10 and a lot of people say oh, you're football and you're intelligent as a footballer so you can play anywhere on the pitch it's difficult as a winger I like to get the ball on the half turn so I can see where the ball is coming from and I can see the player that's about to approach me when you're playing in the 10 more often than not you've your back to goal so yeah. you're checking your shoulders you're looking it's just different angles and getting used to things but yeah, a lot of people just say, oh, you're, you're intelligent, you can play there, and you're thinking, it's not that easy for people. I, I know, going a little bit off topic, but people say that with Trent Alexander-Arnold now, he's a right-back, they're putting him into centre midfield, and they're thinking, isn't he great? I think, yeah, he's great against certain teams in the Premier League. You put him up against a Manchester City, he'll get exposed in there, because right. he's not a great defender. Right. And Liverpool fans are, no, no, he's the answer, and I'm thinking... They only he, see one side of his game, his forward play, I suppose. Yeah. He's yeah. brilliant at that, yeah. but if you have one of the best right-backs in the world going forward, and you're putting him into midfield, you're going to teach him so much stuff in midfield, this is how you play in midfield now, why not just teach him to defend a little bit? <laughs> yeah. I think it's so much easier, just teach him to defend a little bit and keep him going forward. Very, very simple. Yeah. But you're overcomplicating it 
I mean, can you not go and buy a midfielder and put him in there yeah, and yeah. keep one of the best right backs at right back? No, they just sell their sell the other three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coach him out to defend. Yeah, it seems so simple, doesn't it? it seems so simple. Um, uh, Keith, are you you're involved with the uh, the Pats Academy? Is it Pats Seven Nines? Yeah, co- coaching the Seven Nines. Um, are you enjoying that? Yeah, really enjoying it. It's um, it's not something I thought I'd, I would have been suited to. Um, from the outside looking in, football from a very early age was a job to me. And you got up out of bed, you did right. your job, and you went yeah. home. But yeah, I, I done my first day. I bumped into Jerry O'Brien in Ringsend Park while I was walking my dogs, and he, he just basically said, "Listen, would you fancy it, bloody blad?" And I dipped my toe in the water, and the lads were brilliant. I, I remember speaking to one of the boys about how they crossed the ball, making it a little bit flatter so it's easier to to score a goal from. And the reply was, "Thanks, Keith. I appreciate it." And ran off and did the rest of his training. I was thinking, I never spoke to coaches like that. I, I wasn't. Like yeah. bad with coaching, but yeah. I never said thank you. I appreciate it. it was like, mm. and I ran off and tried to do it. Like, <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I just thought it was brilliant the way the the lads, especially in the Pats Academy, they want to learn, they want to move forward, and that's probably one of the the things of being at underage football is nobody thinks that they they finished the article. Everybody's trying to move forward, and if I can play any you know one percent and making them a better footballer or a better person or a bit more mentally sound, then you know I'm happy with what I've done. Brilliant. And you, what about yourself? You're obviously enjoying the long summers. Well, if you can call this a summer, Colin. <laughs> well, it's not yet. The weather hasn't been great. But <laughs> yeah, having eight weeks off, Eric, isn't too bad. Um, and especially when a World Cup is on, it's great. Yeah. Like, I'm still playing. Um, You're still playing? Yeah, still playing. Lens Senior, yeah. For who? River Valley. No, oh, of course. Yeah. Back to the Paris. Yeah, back, back to, to the, the Paris. Paris. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, the media work as well, which I'm enjoying too. So, yeah. Oh my God, my young player plays in the Leinster Senior League. I hope he gets drawn against you as they want to match up. I'll be up to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, he was playing against uh, Talca Rovers there last season, and he, um, Philly McMahon was marking him. <laughs> no Philly way. McMahon, the Dublin footballer, and uh, he's, he's not a bad footballer himself. Yeah. Like, you know, and he texts me after the game, says, I said, your young was very fast, he says. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, listen, lads, uh, we, we've quickly run out of time, and that's to me, is always a sign of a good podcast uh, that the time flies by. So I just want to thank uh, Keith Tracy and Conan Bourne for joining us for episode 19 of the uh, House of Football Sports Joe William Hill podcast. We'll be back next week with more guests, more football. You know what to do. Subscribe, like, share, tell your mates, and we'll talk to you then. You've been listening to House of Football, brought to you by Sports Joe and William Hill.